you want to open your scriptures to Daniel chapter 5, there's a weekend outline in your weekend handout. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, we're going to say a prayer and get right to work. Have mercy, please, O Lord, upon the one who speaks, for his sins are many. And help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. I played catcher on the Little League baseball team. I played catcher in what we called Pony League baseball. I even played catcher on the high school baseball team, albeit mostly second string. When I got to college, I joined a softball intramural team. Guess what position I played? I've spent a lot of time hunkered down behind home plate. Thousands of games, hundreds of thousands of pitches, thousands of innings. And one thing I noticed all those years is that the width of home plate was always 17 inches. This was true in a little league. This was true in Pony League. This was true in high school. This is true in college. This is even true in the major leagues. We baseball players could change much. We could change the batting lineup. We could change uniforms. We could change our bats. But no one could change the width of home plate. Were I to come out of the dugout carrying a homemade home plate that was wider, I could not use it. Were I to reach out and draw a home plate in the dirt, the outline of one in the dirt, because my pitcher couldn't get the ball over home plate, the umpire wouldn't let me use it. Were the umpire himself to have compassion upon me and my pitcher and say, you pitcher just can't do anything today. I've got a 25-inch home plate in my trunk. Would you like me to go get it? That was not allowed. We all understood that. The width of home plate was 17 inches. That was true in Little League. That was true in Pony League. That was true in high school. It's true in college. It's true in the major leagues. It's unchangeable. It's predetermined. It's fixed. It's non-negotiable. It's immutable. You might even go so far as to say that the width of home plate is holy. That's a stretch, I know. But when you think about the width of home plate in baseball and the definition of holiness in the Bible, there are some parallels because what is holy in Scripture is unchangeable. Popular opinion doesn't change it. My preference doesn't change it. The Supreme Court cannot redefine it. What God deems as holy is holy from Little League to the majors, from the beginning of time to the end of time. We would be wise then, wouldn't we, to consider what God deems as holy. Belshazzar regretted the fact that he didn't. Our first point is the dissipation of Belshazzar. We're in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 1. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Belshazzar became king of Babylon in 539 B.C. As you remember or may remember, it was 605 B.C. when a young version of Daniel was taken captive from Jerusalem and brought into Babylonian captivity. This means that we're at the end of Daniel's life. If he was 10 or 11 or 12 years of age when he was taken captive, by this point, he's easily 70, maybe 80 years of age. The reign of King Nebuchadnezzar has ended, and the reign of King Belshazzar is in full swing. King Belshazzar, in a fateful feast, invited a thousand of his gentry to join him in a celebration. 
He had a banquet hall that was 1,650 feet wide, and it was one mile long. And it was decorated with giant elephants, some 4,500 of them, along the wall. There was music, there was dancing, and there was wine. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar and his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. The king and his nobles, his wife and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. When Nebuchadnezzar sacked the temple when Daniel was a boy, he burned it to the ground and they took everything of value. And they carried it from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon. This would include everything that was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. The menorah, the golden artifacts, the table of showbread, the forks, the spoons, and the golden and the silver cups. These items apparently remained untouched in storage for well over half a century until Belshazzar, who somehow knew of them, for some reason thought of them, commanded that they be fetched from storage and brought into his party so that he and his guests could use them as wine goblets. Now, why would he do this? Was there a shortage of goblets in the city of Babylon? Was the dishwasher broken? Was the kitchen staff on strike? Why would he retrieve what he knew were holy artifacts, goblets, that had been taken from the temple in Jerusalem? And why would he use these at a drunken party and then in doing so celebrate the pagan gods of Babylon? There's only one answer. The king wanted to blaspheme the God of Israel. This is an act of blatant sacrilege. And Belshazzar was simply making a mockery of Jehovah God. He used holy utensils in a drunken pagan celebration. And he, in doing so, derided the God of Abraham, of Moses, of Jacob, of Joseph. He derided the God of the Hebrews and hailed the gods that they could make with hands. Speaking of a hand, out of the sleeve of the night, there appeared a mysterious hand. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Can you imagine this scene? A hand detached from a body appeared out of thin air. It hovered in the glow of a lampstand. The palace banquet hall became suddenly silent. A finger from this hand extended and began to write in the plaster on the wall. And then as quickly as it had appeared, it disappeared. Belshazzar gulped. His pompous smile turned into a fearful frown. His knees began to shake. He could no longer stand. He fell to the ground. 
His heart pounded like a kettle drum. He begged for somebody to decipher the words that were on the wall, but his diviners and his astrologers could not. His wife, upon hearing the commotion in the banquet hall, came in and saw what was happening. And she said, don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Call for Daniel. He will tell you what the writing means. The fact that she had to identify Daniel to Belshazzar suggests that by now Daniel has been relegated to a marginal role. Perhaps the new regime came in and didn't have a place for the prophet from Jerusalem. But now this elderly saint is about to play a pivotal role in the future and city of Babylon. He was called into the throne room. Daniel's hair was silver. His back was slightly stooped from the years. But his mind and his faith were keen and honed as steel. The king offered Daniel money and power. Daniel told him he didn't want anything to do with his money and power. Then he reminded Belshazzar how Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar's predecessor, had been disciplined by seven years of insanity. And it took seven years of insanity to finally bring Nebuchadnezzar to his faith and to his senses. Belshazzar was around in those days. Belshazzar saw that, and Belshazzar, according to Daniel, should have been paying attention, but he wasn't. So we have the declaration of Daniel. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all this, instead you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written, many, many, tekel parson. This is what the words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, Paris. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persian. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in Babylon. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. At the precise moment that Daniel was explaining the meaning of the prophecy, the Medo-Persian armies were creeping through the underground aqueducts. Belshazzar never saw it coming. He had a false sense of security. The city had 20 years worth of supplies because they thought they might be under siege. They had the mighty Euphrates River rolling through the heart of the city, so they assumed they would always have access to fresh water. What they did not know is that while they were partying, the Medo-Persians were diverting the river into a canal, thereby lowering the water level so that the soldiers could walk through the river under the city and take Babylon. They overtook it quickly, and it was fatal, and it led to the death of Belshazzar and the arrival of a new dominion. The mighty nation of Babylon collapsed, and their name is now listed among the law, on the long list of nations that have turned from God and felt the consequential judgment. You think this story has any implications for us? This writing on the wall, the fall of the king, the holy utensils used in a pagan party, can this curious, dramatic 
story have any meaning for our generation? I believe it does. Let's look at the interpretation for today. The collapse of Belshazzar issues a sober warning. What is holy to God must be holy to us. What God has deemed as holy must be considered holy among God's people. We have this command. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. The word holy means set apart, unique. It was even used to describe the work of a tailor who would cut off a piece of a garment and set it apart for something special. So when something is called holy, that means it has been set apart for a special use. Belshazzar would have been wise to ask Daniel, why are these utensils considered holy? Had he inquired, he might have heard Daniel explain that these utensils are holy because they are used in an act of communion that reminds us that God wants to commune with his people upon an altar and at the celebration of a feast. That's at the core of Scripture. That's a home plate issue that is holy. That does not change. Consequently, these utensils were consecrated. They were sacred. They were not common. They were not pagan. It's not the gold or the silver that made them holy. It was the message that they conveyed. But Belshazzar disregarded their holiness and consequently was punished by God. Are there things that are holy to God today? Would we not be wise to search the Scriptures for that which is holy, lest we make the mistake of Belshazzar. Shouldn't we ask the question, what is holy to God? Why is it holy to God? And is it holy to me? These are the questions of a disciple. What is holy to God? Why is it holy? What is the message it brings? And is it, right now, holy to me? You're not like Belshazzar, dear child of God. You do not mock the divine, quite the contrary, you revere it. So if something is holy to God, would you not like that it be holy to you? What is holy to God? Why is it holy? Is it holy to me? If you were to search the scriptures for that which is holy to God, you would compile a wonderful list. Here's a sample of a few things that are considered holy to God. First of all, you are holy. According to the Apostle Peter, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people belonging to God. If you're a Christ follower, there's nothing humdrum about you. And when you enter the room, an aura of holiness enters the room with you. You carry the very holiness of God with you and upon you. He dwells in you. The Holy Spirit indwells you. As such, God's holiness is your holiness. Human life is holy to God. God sanctifies human life. Every beating heart, every beating human heart matters to God, whether that life is in the womb of a mother, the cell of a prison, the hallway of a convalescent home, the corner of a Wall Street high-rise, the bunk of a homeless shelter, or in the support of a wheelchair. That human life is holy to God. It's holy. The Scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, we live in a Babylonian culture that devalues life the way that Belshazzar devalued the temple. But the Daniels and the Daniela's in this Babylon consider seriously that which God considers holy. Human life is holy. Marriage is holy. 
marriage is holy. When the wedding officiant speaks of holy matrimony, he or she is not kidding. Jesus described marriage as what God has joined together. Your relationship with your golf buddies is not what God joined together. Your relationship with your bridge club is not what God joined together. Your relationship with your neighbor next door could be a lot of fun, but that's not what God joined together. Marriage is the only relationship into which you can enter that is orchestrated, created, and hear this, consecrated by God. It is holy. It is seen in heaven. It is known in heaven. It is recognized in heaven. And it is a it is a tool of heaven to teach you about God. The purpose of marriage is not to make you happy. The purpose of marriage is to help you be holy. Because it reveals to you, it is a picture, a parable of the relationship that God desires to have with you. So marriage is holy. Sex is holy. This may surprise you. Babylon sees sex as recreation. It files sex in the same manila folder as boating or bowling. As long as two consenting adults want to do it, they can do it however they wish to do so. God sees sees sex as a holy gift set apart for the holy use of uniting a man and a woman beneath the protective canopy and covenant of a marriage. It is holy. It exists to communicate something. It it exists to convey a sense of the intimacy that your heavenly Father desires with you. It's a picture, just like the utensils from the temple were holy to convey a message. So sexual activity within the covenant of a marriage expresses some of the intimacy the oneness, the two becoming one that God desires to have with you. The pornographers don't get this. Hollywood does not get this. The locker room jokesters do not get this. The devil gets this, and that's why he takes something so sacred as sex, and he profanes it into something that ends up bruising and breaking people's hearts. The scripture says there's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. And since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. God's not anti-sex, just the opposite. It's his idea. But he regards it as a holy act, a portrayal of the relationship that he desires with us. Dare we defile that which is holy? Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between a wife and a husband. Does that surprise you that sex is holy? Did you know that the Sabbath is holy from the beginning God has said let six days be used for work and acquisition but let the first one be set apart for spiritual and physical restoration remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy I know we're not under the law I know but the principles still continue And that is God has set apart the beginning of each week as a dedicated, consecrated, holy time in which we set our attention on him, we let our hearts be found in him, and we let our body rest. Some Christians observe a Saturday Sabbath. Some Christians observe a Sunday Sabbath. From my perspective, the day of the observance matters less than the message of the observance. 
And that is God wants us to start our week with eyes on him. And he designates the first day of every week as a time to set our focus on him. He does the same with the first dime of every dollar. Did you know the tithe is holy? A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. The first 10% of everything you earn in God's eyes is something special. It's blessed. It's holy. We don't ever give it to God. We return what is his. The tithe is holy. So is the name of God. The very name of God is holy. No using the name of God, your God in curses or silly banter. God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. Have you ever noticed that Satan never prompts us to say, Satan, damn it? (laughs) Or the demon, damn you? Satan's ploy is to... Rub the luster off the name of God by reducing it to gutter vocabulary. His goal is to bring the name of God down into the level of secular and profane. But those who are Daniels in the midst of Babylon, it's not that we're legalistic about our language, but we are fascinated by the glory of God and how great he is. And we would never ever reduce even the name of God as to something common, ordinary, vernacular. Boy, this list could go on and on of that which is holy, but I guess that's enough. Enough for us to ask the question, are we messing with the width of home plate? There's much discussion these days about what's wrong with our society. The diagnosis points at a predictable list of culprits. Our economy's too weak, our military's too fragile, our government's too corrupt, our education is too imbalanced, our politicians are off base. But the book of Daniel, in fact, the whole Bible, encourages us to ask a more fundamental question, and it is this. Do we agree with God's definition of holiness? As a society, as a country, are we submitting ourselves to heaven's view of the sacred? How could the answer be anything but no? We disregard the value of life and abort hundreds, sometimes thousands of babies every day. It was a Belshazzar moment. When we dared to tell God we've got a new definition for marriage. And it's a Belshazzar moment when we casually dissolve what he regards as sacred. Promiscuous sex is seen in our day as a badge of honor. And a symbol of open-mindedness. We take pride in working first and resting later rather than worshiping first so that we can work better. The mark of a deteriorating society is its disregard for that which is holy. The mark of a deteriorating society is its disregard for that which is holy. What about us as individuals? Lest we be too quick to point the finger at society, do we ever need to look in the mirror? Is God challenging you to imitate Daniel? To view life as sacred? To view sex as sacred? To view worship as sacred? Do we share God's definition of holiness? If not, guess whose definition needs to change? Odds are somebody is thinking, Locato, I didn't come to church today for a sermon like this. I like it when you tell me how much God loves me and how everything's going to be great, how it's going to get me through the storms of life. I've got enough problems and burdens in life without being a gift, giving a, a list 
of that which is holy, without, without a call to holiness. I've already got enough things to do. Could it be that your life is burdensome for the lack of holiness? Could it be that God knows more about what you need to survive in Babylon than you do? And could it be the reason that your life is so complicated is because you have failed to submit to his definition of a holy marriage, holy sex, his holy view and right view of your money and your work and your relationships and human life and even yourself. God's commands are not burdensome. But they are utterly different than the world in which we live. In these last days, the world is going to grow increasingly putrid and vile, barring a revival from God. In the way that you will thrive in Babylon is by recognizing you're a salmon swimming upstream against the current of popular opinion. Your goal is not to fit in. Your goal is to please Him. If your goal is to fit in, you'll get sucked under. But if your goal is to please Him, you will discover a happy holiness. The happiest people in the world are those who have connected with their heavenly Father and find their relationship nourished by these disciplines of holiness. Be clear, we are not saved by being holy. We, like Belshazzar, have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. But we have Jesus Christ as the one who has tipped the scales in our direction. Because when he died on the cross, he not only shed his blood for you, he gave his holiness to you. And so as you now stand before God, one holy, you find within you the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God that is hungering for opportunities to display that holiness. And so you march through life not listening to what Babylon says, but you're hungry like, Bab- like Daniel was for what God says. Amen. You do not change the width of home plate. Belshazzar tried to do so. He lived to regret it. Our society is doing so. We will regret it. May you not do so. And if you choose God over them, you won't regret that. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you, our holy God, asking that you have mercy upon us, upon this church. We have grown rich. We have grown lazy. We have grown insolent. Heavenly Father, if you do not come and quicken us and awaken us, we could fall away from you. Grant, O Heavenly Father, those holy speed bumps that slow us down and those God-ordained curbs that keep us on the right path. And when and where we swerve or sway or deviate from your plan, we invite you to show us as a church, as individuals, as families, as a nation lest it be too late. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. I'll take Jesus. You're there.